Hi, my name's Londe Yusuf. And my name is Reggie Williams. And we're the co-founders of Black Film Space. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. We host events such as screenwriting workshops, panels, mixers, and other events that are designed to support black content creators. In the next episode of the Black Film Space podcast, we interview Numa Perrier. Numa is an actress, writer, producer, and director well known for her original web series umbrella, Black and Sexy TV. Her first feature film, Jezebel, was shown at South by Southwest this year. Perrier has also directed an episode of Queen Sugar. We talk with Numa about the process of making Jezebel, why she wants to launch a million dollar foundation for black women filmmakers, and much more. But before we begin the interview, we have a few brief announcements about our events in May 2019. We have two screenwriting workshops, one on Thursday, May 16th, and one on Thursday, May 30th, both in Manhattan. Admission is $6. On Saturday, May 11th, we are hosting a directing workshop with Shaka King in downtown Brooklyn. Shaka King is a native and resident of bed who has written and directed episodes of HBO's High Maintenance and Random Acts of Flyness. We are going to screen select scenes from his latest films, Newlyweeds and Mulligans, followed by a Q&A to discuss how he executed his vision. This workshop is ideal for filmmakers who want an inside look on why King made specific angle choices, lighting choices, the process of working with actors, and much more. For more info on all these events, visit blackfilmspace.com. Now, on to our interview. All right, thank you, Numa, for joining us for the Black Film Space podcast. Thank you for having me. So, recently, you you just had your uh, your first feature film, Jezebel. Jezebel. It was screened at South by Southwest. Um, how has the reception of Jezebel affected your trajectory as a filmmaker? Oh, it's uh, it's been tremendous. Um, I've been working for a number of years making my own short films and video art and many, many multiple web series Mm -hmm. episodes, uh, one-off things. You know, I've been trading for a long time and I, uh, moving into directing, writing and directing my first feature and then having it go to South by pretty much put me on the map uh, for people who just didn't know that I've been creating so much work for so long Mm -hmm. uh it really it really does put you in a different league for people to recognize that you even exist Mm -hmm. as a filmmaker and so for that it's been huge and south by is such a huge platform that the industry looks towards every year following sundance really Mm -hmm. um that it just it yeah it just people are taking me more seriously. Mm. People know who I am that didn't know before. And the people who have kind of known who I am and what I've been doing, um, yeah, they're taking me a bit more seriously now as far as, you know, someone to consider to direct their project mm-hmm. or to, you know, collaborate with in other ways. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, how, how long did, how long was the process um, for getting into South by Southwest. What what was that process like? Well, I had to make the film first. So um, that was a, a, a process that, depending on where you start the clock, took a number of years. Um, but once I really committed to making the film, everything moved pretty quickly, though it didn't feel like it was moving quickly to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I wrote like, the first 15 pages of the script maybe seven years ago Wow! and you know and kind of put it away and didn't think about it much until I was asked to submit a short film to uh, Tribeca Film Institute was doing a fellowship for women filmmakers and this was kind of the beginning of different film institutes really focusing on women as filmmakers and creating mentorship programs around that and you know, putting money behind that. And that was 2015. 
I pulled that script back out of my dresser drawer <laughs> mm-hmm. and I submitted it as a short film, even though it was never intended to be so. That was the only short script that I had that I didn't co-write with someone else mm-hmm. um, that I was excited about, you know, sending and I that I felt really spoke to my voice and the type of work that I wanted to continue doing. And uh, and they selected me, and uh, that got the ball rolling all over again. Mm-hmm. Still took time <laughs> because I still had to finish writing a feature script to actually have something to film. And so um, probably another year went by where I didn't write very much more. And I don't know. I think I just was afraid of it in a way and uh, didn't move forward until... I don't know, something finally just kind of clicked in me that said, if you don't do this now, you're never going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of started beating myself up and saying, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, um, my instincts were telling me that this was a film that needed to be made, that that people would really get something out of. But the only thing that was standing in the way was me finishing the freaking writing Mm -hmm. and I just finally kicked myself in the butt and said you gotta finish this movie that's it you know Mm -hmm. you just stop giving yourself excuses and from that point on everything moved really fast so from the point that I really gave myself an ass kicking um we I went and wrote the script in three weeks I did a rewrite another couple of weeks for that. We did a table read and then we went to Las Vegas a few weeks later and filmed. And then we were in post-production for about, about a year because I had to cobble together the budget to um, finish the movie. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't have it all at once. So yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the, the long story of it. It took a long time, but once I made the commitment, it took, a short time so we filmed the summer before last and we then we went to south by just last month so wow so so you went from writing the script to shooting in in a matter of weeks or a few months yeah i once i lit the fire i was working (laughs) on everything happening at the same time so while i was writing the script i had already met with tiffany pinnell who i knew i wanted to play the lead Uh, So we had already sat down and I told her, I know this is crazy. I don't have a full script for you yet, but this is basically the outline of it. I told her, you know, what would be expected of her and what the story was about. And I said, hey, I'm going to Miami for a few weeks. When I come back, I'll have the full feature for you to read. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if she believed me or not, but that's the decision I made. And so I already had it, the story mapped out in my brain. I just had to put it down on paper. And, you know, you, until you have that script, you don't have anything that you can break down. You don't have anything that you can budget around. You have to have something, even if it's a detailed outline. I mean, but you really want to have your script in place. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so once I once I did that, I was making everything else happen at the same time. So I was already producing the film and, and um, calling on crew members and, getting a, a producing partner attached with me and all of that was happening in tandem. Mm. So this is, this is all you were basically doing then with your time. That time. Yeah. I mm-hmm. said, you know, because at the time I was, uh, I was able to carve some time off for myself mm-hmm. around a lot of the, the work that I was doing in the digital space. So all of the web series that I was part of, um, I, w- they, they were not filming at the time. There was like a couple of weeks off. um, And there was a series filming that I wasn't a creator on. So I could step away and do my feature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. That's, that's, I am, I am inspired right now. (laughs) So much. It was a narrow window of time. It was narrow because (laughs) um, yeah. And I think that part Partially that limitation pushed me forward as well because I didn't know when I was going to have another window of time Mm. where the crew would be available, where certain equipment would be available, where my personal time would be available. Um, Just everything, even with my daughter, you Mm -hmm. know, not having school during that time. We filmed in the summer. 
everything lined up the way that it was supposed to. Mm-hmm. Everyone who I wanted to work with, they were in between a project as well. Mm-hmm. And um, I just knew, I, I felt like that was the universe speaking to me, like, now is your moment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, like jump in and get it done. And I really, I believe that that's true because everything that's unfolded has unfolded in such a serendipitous way ever since I made that move. Yeah. Wow, really blown away by that. That that's amazing and yeah, really inspiring. And yeah, it's a, it's all about seizing opportunities. What uh, did you have any producing partners at this time, or when did you, when and how did you land your first producing partner? So my first producing partner um, is my sister, uh, who, funny enough, while I was thinking about getting this movie made and while it was gnawing away at me we were having a conversation and she said, you know, I really want to support something that you do. I want to, I want to invest in something this out of the blue. I did not ask her for any money, mm-hmm. <laughs> but she just felt, she, she must've just felt my vibes because she said she wanted to invest in something that I was part of. And I said, well, actually I really want to make a movie about when we used to live in Las Vegas together and uh, when I went, when I started doing cam girling and I uh, really want to make a movie about that, and she immediately said yes. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, this is how much money I will need to get started. And she said, okay. And then, <laughs> um, and then later it became less money than that mm-hmm. because I just she'd never done anything in the movie industry before. She didn't really understand why we needed so much money. Mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of went from like one amount to ending up being more like 65% of that amount, but I still took it, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I still took that money and I still went and made the movie with it. Uh, so she was, you know, the first person to come on board and really, really put her money there. And then I knew that I needed uh, someone to be my right hand with me on set and helping me uh, just, making the film actually happen like a, mm-hmm. a on the on set producer there with me every day and so I reached out uh, to a woman Winter Dunn who I had worked with um I had worked with she she had worked mostly as a production assistant um also as an actress uh on a couple of my web series but I just had a feeling that she had the knack for producing as well and mm-hmm. taking on more responsibility. So I reached out to her and I said, hey, I know you've never done this before, but <laughs> what do you think about, you know, producing my feature, Jezebel? I'm definitely going to be right there with you, you know, working right beside you, but I need a right hand. I need someone who understands this and who wants to jump in there with me. And she was like, yeah, let's do it. Nice, nice. <laughs> so I sent her the script, and she became more excited after that as well. And it was, we pretty much held hands and got the movie done. Okay. That's dope. That's dope. So you you said you wrote the script in about three weeks, right? Yeah, three, three weeks, weeks plus six years. So <laughs> Three weeks plus six years. Yeah. How did you know when yeah. it was finished? I mean, I know it's like a instinctive type thing but how did you know that this is complete i'm ready to shoot when i when i understood what the last what the last moment of the film should be mm-hmm. uh, that's when I knew it was finished i um and it's funny because part of that kind of happened on set so it is on paper uh but on paper the movie actually extends a little bit further the story moves a little more forward than it than the final than the final cut of the film Mm -hmm. and it was in the making of it and filming one of the final scenes I realized oh this is the final scene of the movie Mm. not this other scene and so um so you never quite completed it then I kind of I kind of discovered it on set uh even though that moment exists in the movie it wasn't the final moment of Mm. the movie Mm. on the script Okay. That's dope. Yeah. I think yeah. We made a lot of discoveries in the midst of, you know, voices and voices are speaking to me on set. You mm-hmm. know, I would discover things in the middle of the process and immediately just go with my instincts on it. Mm-hmm. 
it's kind of like um doc documentary filmmaking you kind of just have to to feel it out and, and just trust your instinct on set yeah, yeah. exactly you got to have your blueprint you got to have your script and then that kind of gives you the the latitude to push further or back away from it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, did you what did you learn um while making your first feature film because you have years of experience writing directing producing content shorter form content did you learn anything gosh i learned so much i uh i learned quite a lot i thought that making a feature would be pretty similar to what i had done before mm -hmm. and in some ways it was um it's the same it was the same kind of fast very fast paced very under pressure, think out of the box, think on your toes type of environment for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, what the indie space is, is like. Uh, that's how we work. We're very guerrilla. We, we have to get in there and, and do things that films and projects with bigger budgets and, and a more streamlined studio process just don't have, you just aren't able to pivot as fast with certain things. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I learned was no matter how much experience I had, and no matter how similar it was to everything else I'd already done in the indie space, making a feature film is its own beast. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why people take you more seriously when you do a feature. It's not just because, uh, you know, it's not just because you have this piece of property that can actually be sold in more ways than a sh something short form can. It's because it's so you have to sustain your vision over a longer period of time and in a with a different type of stamina and endurance um, throughout the piece. Mm -hmm. And and so it's called more. It calls upon more of your skill and more of your talents, more of your instincts. It, call, it just calls so much more of you forward. And uh, that was something I was a little bit surprised by. And I definitely learned that, like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> this isn't just like, okay, I've made all these shorts and now making a feature is going to be like making five shorts in a row. It's like, no, it's, it's a bit different than that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, yeah, you have to expand. It's more expansive. What do you mean by you have to expand? So every your vision has to be greater. Your vi your um, the road is longer. It's a it's more of a marathon. Mm -hmm. And for me, someone who I'm definitely a sprinter in every way, whether that's like in real life <laughs> or everything. You know, everything that I've done have has kind of been sprints. And so you know, making a feature is definitely more of a marathon. And I had to embrace that and I had to understand that that's not necessarily my strength um I had to figure out well what kind of marathon runner am I you know and how how do I in, you know keep my endurance up through this whole thing mm -hmm. how do I have a plan that really extends far down to places I can't see and how many days were you shooting we filmed a total of 10 days we did I want to say 11. It's like 10, 11 days, um, which is very quick. Yes, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> so I would say that so my marathon was like one of those short marathons. You know? <laughs> it's a half marathon. <laughs> but, or a um, quarter marathon. Anything over 5K is a marathon. So yeah. I feel like my feature was, you know, like a 10K probably, like that type of, it wasn't like one of these like 26 mile things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so we had to work fast and my script is also was only 90 pages. So it wasn't one of these 100 plus page scripts where we needed more than that. It would have been nice to have maybe three or four more days uh, just to take our time in certain areas. But I think the limitations actually worked in our favor um, by the end of it. So, uh, yeah. It was how so? How, how did the limitations? Kind of days of actual filming and about a year of post off and on as I could cobble it together. Okay. How, how did the limitations work for you, for your team? 
it kept the film really fresh because there were certain scenes where we could only do one take. Mm-hmm. We just um, didn't have the time or the resources to be able to reset the scene. Um, you know, certain things where things were going to get messy or, you know, we weren't going to be able to start all over and have that look the same as it did. So I would say, okay, uh, this is a one I mean, we're going to do this in one take. Mm-hmm. So that required me having to have a really great plan with my DP, but also trust him uh, to pivot if he needed to <laughs> mm-hmm. while I'm in the scene acting uh, with Tiffany. And um, it just required of uh, the actors to really be ready to go and to be fully invested and not think that, oh, that was a warm up for them. You know, we mm-hmm. kind of, we had to shoot very economically for certain things and then we would save our time for some of the scenes where I knew we weren't going to be able to do it in one take because we had to cover maybe five actors in that scene at once and um, I, I would plan more time in the day for that scene mm-hmm. and then for other scenes it's like okay we're only going to do this once maybe twice so be ready mm-hmm. <laughs> that was the thing I would just say to everyone stay ready that was like the theme of the entire shoot mm-hmm. and even once we you know got into South by that has just been our motto stay ready okay well that, so- that sounds really intense that's basically like nine pages a day um yeah and so is it like dialogue heavy is the film dialogue heavy? yeah yeah yeah, I yeah. Think so. yeah. Mm-hmm. It, what what was the the process like working with the actors like did you give them any notes in between takes uh yeah i mean i definitely directed them so it, in between takes um if there was something that needed to be adjusted i would just say what it was and we they would make the adjustments they're all really really quick and know you know professional and they know what they're doing and mm-hmm. they took notes great so um you know when we had when I knew it was only going to be one take or maybe two, we would talk about it beforehand. But we spent a lot of time talking about the material leading up to the shoot. Mm. Um, I had separate conversations with each actor. And so everyone pretty much came ready to fire. Okay. Okay, awesome. Um, what about, you know, the, the, the differences between creating a web series in terms and the difference, the difference between creating a web series and producing an indie film in terms of funding and support. I think the funding and support is kind of the same. I did crowdfunding. I've I've done a campaign on almost every crowdfunding platform, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, GoFundMe, and they're all at the base the same. It's about really exciting your fan base and um, making a commitment to them and walking side by side with them as they support you with whatever they can. Mm -hmm. And then just letting that multiply and really investing them in your story uh, by being transparent and by just letting them know what, what it means to you and hoping that it also means something to them. So it's really, web series to me is independent TV. An independent film is independent film. So mm-hmm. to me, it's all the indie space. And the indie space survives by your fans, really, mm-hmm. and your, your support group and your peers uh, lifting you up and, and throwing money your way. Mm-hmm. How many crowdfunding campaigns have you, have you done in your career? Um, I want to say at least five. Mm. And then I've helped many, I've helped many people raise money and I've consulted with many people, including Mr. Spike Lee. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I was one of, his, one of his main consultants on his Kickstarter that he did a few years back for his vampire movie. Mm-hmm. So you've done, you've so, done. Um, yeah. I'm, really, I'm really well versed in that lane and I enjoy raising money and it's fun to me. And I, and I understand how it works. So I've I've consulted with people and then I've also, you know, done my own for several projects I've been mm. a creator on, actor on. Okay. Yeah, I feel like the reason why I asked that question is because for me personally, I haven't done a crowdfunding campaign. I I will likely do one soon. But one of the reasons why I haven't done it is because 
I, I have this apprehension about asking my network for money multiple times um, and kind of just wanting to do it once. And like with that, you know, hoping that this is the only time I have to do it and I won't have to do it again. So, I mean, what do you like, what do you say to people like me who are scared to do crowd more than one or two crowdfunding campaigns? Well, if you haven't done even one, then you can't, I mean, it, it doesn't, what you're saying, it doesn't hold a lot of water because mm. you haven't done it yet. Mm. So I would say you got to do your first one before you, you worry about doing a second one. Yeah, so I guess the it's first more... one and, and do, do the first one, be successful, commit, keep your word as much as possible. Um, you know, and then you can kind of assess if you need to do another one later for a different reason. The ones that I've done have all been for separate, different projects. Yeah. And each project has its group of people who want to see that project made. And um, sometimes you're going to have the same people will contribute to every single campaign you do. And other times it's going to be a whole new crowd of people or it's going to be people that didn't support maybe your first one because they weren't as interested in that. But now you're doing something that really mean, matters to them in a different way, you mm-hmm. know, but I don't, none, none of it matters if you, until you've done your first one, you've got to do your first one. It's not something to worry about. In other words, is, got it. Okay. You yeah, you can't worry about the second one until you do the first. Okay. So I'm, I'm about to do 10 crowdfunding campaigns, one every year. Till uh, till it all pops Maybe off. Maybe you can do that. <laughs> yeah, you might you might be able to do that. That yeah. might be a sustainable way for you to continue doing the project that you want to do. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something something to think about. I'm definitely inspired by the amount of crowdfunding campaigns that you've you've accomplished. Are there any like specific creative moments that you could think about in your career that you know um, were influenced by? a limited budget and how you work through those moments? I think it's made me very resourceful because ever, even when I didn't have any budgets to do anything, I was always finding a way um, <laughs> and really doing crowdfunding before crowdfunding apps were, were launched, you know, for mass use. Um, so for me, it's always about, if you're really creative, if you're really passionate about something, if this is really in your blood, you're going to find a way to do it no matter what. And not having the financial resources can stimulate more of your creativity, but also having more money to do what you want to do also stimulates your creativity. So I don't necessarily buy into one side or the other, like too much money takes away creativity and not enough money um, galvanizes creativity. I mean, it's just, it's all kind of like how you deal with your own creative survival. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it's part of your survival to create, because that's what you were born to do and that's in your blood, you're going to find a way, you're going to find a way no matter what to, to get it done. And there's so many resources beyond money that we can utilize to get things done. Mm -hmm. And, um, but money is also important. So I think you're going to always find yourself figuring out how to leverage those two things, even, even on, um, you know, bigger budget things, which I'm getting more into now having, you know, larger budgets to do things. It's all, there's always a negotiation going on. Uh, (laughs) There's Mm -hmm. always a negotiation. So it's all just money with different amounts of digits. And so you're all, you're always, you're always faced with something you have to negotiate or be more, think, think more creatively about. Um, Yeah. I would even say that probably for the biggest budgets that exist out there, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to do certain films. Those films are constantly negotiating their budgets, constantly Mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to accomplish these huge things that they want to do in these films and um, have the cast that they want and ha- you know, just have everything that they want for this, you know, mega fantasy world to exist. And you're constantly negotiating that. So it never goes away. And uh, yeah. So I think that your creativity is going to be tested on every 
every scale, like throughout that entire spectrum of mm -hmm. budgets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You recently were, you know, talking about your goal of making your production company, House of Numa, a million dollar foundation to help black women get their first features made. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So it's a dream that I have. Uh, and I feel like that dream will expand and change and as it, as I start accomplishing it. But kind of the root of it is a million dollars to start. And it's kind of a cross between a foundation that has a grant, but also a production company, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, because I would want to be more involved in the process of it than not. Uh, but it's a million dollars and a million dollars uh, for the first year would be divided up into four. So there would be four films that roll out in that first year that get made in that first year. Mm -hmm. So every quarter, uh, one black woman would get to make her first feature for 250 K. Wow. And 250,000 is, to a lot of people, not enough money to make a feature, and to a lot of other people, it's plenty. Yeah. <laughs> and um, really, my excitement around it is that I've read so many so many scripts from friends of mine and peers of mine that these films can be made in the low six figures. Mm -hmm. They can. Mm -hmm. They they can also be made for more, but they can definitely get made for around that amount. And I think that there could be a good return on investment because I think black women are part of the driving force of the, of the film industry, as far as dollars that we spend mm -hmm. and we want to see these movies. So if, if we're able to create and they're just not being made fast enough mm -hmm. is kind of my, my frustration and, and, kind of the impetus behind it is that only getting one black woman or maybe two per year making her first feature is not enough and yeah. I feel like it's just going so slow and yeah it's just going it's just moving too slow for me and I feel like there's got to be a way around that and so I'm seeing all these scripts and I'm reading them and I'm like this is a good script this is a simple story uh but a story that people would want to see that i know mm -hmm. black women would want to see and i know that like that budget could get covered and that i just think that there's a business model that hasn't really been uh it hasn't been executed it hasn't been acted upon mm -hmm. and i'm i'm wondering if there's a way to make that happen mm -hmm. and i think there is i think that with a million dollars you could start you, so in your first year, you'd have four films and you can keep going from there. Mm -hmm. You can maybe the next year you have more money, but uh, I have a real issue with a lot of these pitching and institutions that are doing things where, I don't know, it feels like it's more of a publicity stunt for the institution mm -hmm. than it is actually moving the needle mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. And so you have people um, who are making it to the final rounds and they're getting all of this attention, but they're not getting their movie made in the end. You know, only one of them is. And that's not enough. Why do you think that is? Because I think that everyone wants to be on the right side of history mm -hmm. right now. And mm -hmm. so I think every institution is trying to figure out and I think some genuinely want to help. I think that they, they're they only just thinking about it in one way, you know, because I guess that's how it's been done before. And they're like, okay, so we'll do our own pitch thing. And so let's launch our pitch thing and let's make it open to women of color or people of color, you know, and let's make it really diverse and let's get a bunch of people to send their scripts in and then we'll go through this whole process and we'll choose one <laughs> mm -hmm. because at the end of the day their sponsor or their um you know whoever is toning up the money for it only has so much that they're going to partner with on it and so it kind of becomes like it's just got to be one mm -hmm. and um and I don't think it has to go that way I think that there's there's got to be a better way and I'm sure that there'll be, you know, bumps and hiccups in what and what it is I'm trying to do, 
and I'll have to kind of learn and figure it out along the way. But yeah, my vision for it is to start with a million dollars and it's not a pitch competition. It's um, a selection committee Mm -hmm. that selects, you know, the scripts that can be made for that budget and that we feel will, will do the best um, out in the world with that budget Mm -hmm. and start launching more careers. Nice. I, I, Wish you all the best with that, and it would be amazing to see that happen. Um, do you have like a general timeline or general next steps that you're open to sharing with us? For me, it's about taking meetings, which I'm starting to do, taking meetings with interested parties uh, who would want to back that. You know, <laughs> who wants to write the first million dollar check <laughs> uh, is, is basically it, you know, and then, you know, setting up the structure for it. But yeah, I okay. I have started taking meetings. The word is kind of spreading about it. People are curious about it. They're asking me about it. So I believe that it will happen. I see it happening. Yeah. Um, I don't know who my partner on it is going to be yet, but I think the more that people kind of talk about it and spread the word about it, um, it's gonna come into place. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we're, we're you know we're definitely rooting for you over at Black Film Space. In regards to indie filmmakers receiving funding for their films, what what basic questions should they be able to answer? Um, what basic questions should indie filmmakers be able to answer before or in order to receive funds for their film? Well, I think it depends on how much money you're asking for. And uh, um, everything starts with the script. So the first thing is really having an understanding of your script and why this story is important or why this story is something fresh that we haven't quite seen before that's going to stand out, uh, that's going to be worth the ride. Because whoever gives you money for your movie, they're going to be on that ride with you. And you want it to be a good ride. So, it's you know, you got to kind of sell that, that it's, it's going to be worth the journey. And um, for whatever reason, not everyone is investing in, in movies because actually most people are not investing in movies <laughs> thinking they're going to get this huge return mm-hmm. um you know they they hope that they do but they're also investing in movies um because of the story and because of the filmmaker behind it mm-hmm. uh, and sometimes because of the stars involved as well but a lot of it comes really down to the filmmaker and their vision and um you have to be passionate about that you have to be able to really articulate it and get people as excited as you are and that's how you get your money okay okay um so there, there's a lot also, of i think showing that you're gonna make it no matter what I, it's kind of a weird thing it's like i think that any person that's ever given me any money and i don't care if it's um someone who gave me five dollars on indiegogo or someone that gave me in the thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, for other projects, I think it's always come down to, and they told me this, they said, it wasn't so much the project, it was you, mm-hmm. you know, it was you that we wanted to support. And I think that's because they see that I'm going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. And they want to be part of the train that's already moving, you know? Mm-hmm. And even if I don't know how I'm going to do something, I show up like, it, no, this is, this is happening. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, I would love it if you joined me, but this is happening and these are my needs for it. And um, I'd like you to join me, you know, and I, that, you know, that's like a little tip that I can give for any person raising money or doing crowdfunding. That's, that's one of the first things I always say to people is don't ask people for their support and their help ask them to join you Mm -hmm. uh, because you're already doing it and it's it's about joining up with a team not um asking for a handout or it's not charity Mm -hmm. so uh it's something of of value to join in on okay all right that's a great tip um I, i just wanted to briefly talk about uh gatekeepers there's a lot of you know conflicting views of whether or not there are gatekeepers in Hollywood and and who they are. Do you believe that there still are gatekeepers? Of course. Yes. There's gatekeepers everywhere. 
<laughs> Who are these There's people? always a gatekeeper to anything you want. Uh, gatekeepers are can be anyone. The gatekeeper can sometimes be the, the, the assistant to the person you're trying to get to, mm-hmm. and they're not going to let you get to that person. They're, they're at the gate, and you will get the runaround. <laughs> they will tell you that that person's on a call or they're busy or they'll call you back, whatever it is. You know, gatekeepers exist in so many different forms and and they always will there there's yeah there's always going to be a line there's always going to be a club that you're not part of um yeah you have to do it anyways you have to create anyways and it's this in this business one thing that I've definitely learned and like you know the 10 plus years I've been in it is that no one who's really serious ever leaves so um everyone who's really about it is always going to be in this industry on some level doing something. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of accepting that, you know, and knowing that that assistant who gave you the runaround may be running a studio in three years, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, I, or the person who's running a studio may pivot and start directing movies instead, you know, it's like, (laughs) But if you're in the industry, you're always in the industry. And you, you just have to accept that there are all these different roles. And some of those roles are gatekeepers. And mm-hmm. they may not want to let you in. So you have to find your own way. You have to find your own crowd, your own thing. And, again, if it's in your blood, there will be nothing else that you even know how to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's just like this is the thing that you do and that you're passionate about. And, you know, there are going to be people who just don't like you or just don't want you around, mm. you know, and then, you know what, in a few years, that person might hire you for a job. Mm-hmm. You just don't know <laughs> how things are going to go. But one thing that people respect and one thing um, that is undeniable is if you keep going and if you don't let anyone deter you in that way, you know, we have, you know, people who used to be agents have their own, you know, like uh, Charles King uh, was once a talent agent and is basically running his own type of studio Mm. system now, you know, that, that supports his agenda and supports his values. And, 10 years ago, that was not the position that he was in. Mm -hmm. He was in a different position, you know, um, that had its own power. He was a gatekeeper in a different way, you know, and now he's the gatekeeper of his own estate, basically, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, everybody has the ability to to move, but none of us really ever go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So just, just accept it. There's gatekeepers in every industry. If this is your industry, and this is what you want to do. Just, just get in there and know that that's how it is. And a lot of people are going to tell you no or not even respond to you. But other people will open up to you, especially if you keep doing the work. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, do you think that there are any avenues or ways of getting our content noticed and funded that you think Black indie filmmakers are overlooking in, you know, this year, two thousand nineteen? Yeah, I think that the digital space is kind of getting overlooked again, um, where it, it it was thriving for a few years, and then a lot of the people who were thriving in that space moved on to do, you know, traditional TV and or Netflix, which is basically high budget web series, <laughs> um, uh, and and feature films, and kind of. It makes me a little sad because I see kind of a like missed opportunity in that um, people use the digital space as a stepping stone to just continue to step into the game that they were trying to create their own brain, but they ended up, it just got, you know, it's, I just feel like as soon as it became really powerful for Black people to be doing things in the digital space, a lot of the bigger budget, um, you know, studio systems kind of swooped in and said, oh, we're going to create our own, you know, subdivision so that mm-hmm. there's something for Black people here and Black people there and Black people there, which is really, really great that they did that because it gave a lot of us jobs mm-hmm. and gave a lot of us careers. Um, 
But now it's kind of like when people create in the digital space, they're hoping to launch themselves into that, into that system. Mm -hmm. And that is great. Again, (laughs) we all want to be, you know, making good money and having a big career. What the bottom kind of fell out of people continuing to create in the digital space and letting finding a way for that to support them, mm-hmm. you know, and um, yeah, it just kind of became a stepping stone only. And that's a very big missed opportunity. There's still a huge way to, and I'm even thinking about this, you know, for my own film mm-hmm. is how, um, you know, it's like once I made a feature, mm-hmm. you're kind of expected to move it along the traditional path as far as getting it, getting distribution Mm -hmm. and um, there's still this very wide open opportunity to self-distribute online Mm -hmm. and that's something that I that I'm really still thinking about a lot because just because um, a lot of people use it as a stepping stone doesn't mean that it's not still this very valuable space and I think that um, a lot of people aren't seeing it that way because it has been used as more of a means to an end. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like part of it could could be because there's more content now in general. So like 10 years ago, if you had a web series, I feel like it had a higher chance of like sticking out, building an audience. Um, whereas now there's right. so much content. It just, I think it makes sense for a lot of creatives to be like, all right, let me get on to like a established platform so I can have this cachet and then eventually move up to TV and all this other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally get it. And that's not a system that we're going to deconstruct nor overnight, nor should we exactly be trying to, you know, topple it over. Um, but there, it's still somewhat of a missed opportunity. Mm. Uh, yeah. Because I think that while that Renaissance was happening, it could have become, much deeper and much more um it, it just has more it has more potential than i think people took advantage of mm-hmm. okay yeah and you know part of it is definitely that you know that there's so much now like so it's kind of like with crowdfunding you know that was a novelty and people made more money doing that when crowdfunding first came out and now it's harder to get out there and launch a Kickstarter because people are like, really, (laughs) you know, it's not, it doesn't have the same freshness that it did in 2014, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, not at all. And, you know, five years is a long time in the digital space. So it's like, that was a long time ago when people were really able to, you know, launch something and people really get behind it. Now there's so many, Uh, But it doesn't mean that there's still not a way to kind of figure out how to work everything to your advantage that's like outside of traditional Hollywood system. Like you can still really make social media work for you in a big way. You can still make YouTube and Vimeo and you can still make these platforms really work for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, It just, you you do have to cut through a lot more noise now. So I completely get it that, um, that people are like, well, what's kind of the new way to get noticed? What's the new way to, what's the new innovation? And I'm not sure where it is right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'll probably just pop up and you gotta, you just gotta keep your eyes open. Probably come out of nowhere. Yeah. Next couple of years. Um, Yeah. So congratulations on, on being chosen uh, to direct an episode of Queen Sugar. That is outstanding. Love that show. So congratulations for that. Um, Thank you. So are you going to, are you going to take like, like, I guess, how do you prep for directing television? Cause that's a whole nother, I'm assuming that's a whole nother. So I just got back. So I directed my episode already. I just got back. Okay. Um, The prep, the prep for it was pretty intense. Uh, I mean, as with anything, you get your script first. Um, I read it. I really felt connected to the script right away, which I was, you know, very happy about um, because if I didn't, I would have had to find a way to find something to connect to. But, 
I, you know, Valerie Woods wrote the script and I connected to all of it. You know, the, I understood it. Um, I, and I, there were key scenes in there that I was excited about right away, visually, uh, creatively, everything. So all of that is, is good. Like I went in excited about the material I was working with. Uh, when you go, you have the option of shadowing for two days Mm -hmm. and I took that option because I just (laughs) did not want to go in there cold um, because I didn't know what to expect and I'm really glad that I did the two days of shadowing because it wasn't so much that I was um, next to the director who was she was uh, directing her episode Uh, I did get to see her work and I did get to you know be behind the monitor and see kind of how she was doing things but what I really benefited from was shadowing um, Lacey Duke, who was in prep for her episode mm-hmm. at that time. Mm-hmm. So, so I was able to shadow Lacey, who was prepping, and I was able to sh- uh, shadow Carmen, who was actually directing. But I spent most of my time in the sh- uh, shadow process, in the prep shadow process. Mm-hmm. So that was great because I was able to see how, you know, the way they have it set up with the studio is I'm basically meeting with every department. So every it's, it's pretty much a dozen or more meetings that you have to attend Mm -hmm. (laughs) and um, discuss your vision with, with each department head and see what's actually possible and, and get their thoughts and collaborate on what they think should happen as Mm -hmm. well. So Mm -hmm. I really, really love that. As much as I don't like meetings, I do love collaboration. Mm-hmm. So I was able to, um, you know, just shoot off my ideas and hear their ideas and then meet in the middle where we needed to on things and understand, you know, how how the budgets work on a TV show and um, how that's co- a constant negotiation um you know just um it's very involved it's a very involved process and it's a week of that and then you're directing Mm -hmm. then you're behind the wheel you know you're in the chair and um I was doing fine until probably the last two days before it was time for me to actually direct Mm -hmm. (laughs) I had gotten so used to kind of going to all the meetings and doing all the prep then I started getting really nervous like oh my god it's like opening night, you know, showtime. I got to actually direct now, you yeah. know, prep is over. And so, <laughs> and so I started getting really nervous. Um, but once I got in the chair and once we got our first take going and I, I was able to get in there and work with the actors and do the part that I love so much, just to go through the process of what the story actually is. Um then I was fine mm. after that point, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good, I, you know, I call it, it's this huge creative factory. Mm. And so you get to be part of the factory, but it's really creative at the mm. same time. So you don't just feel like you're a cog in the wheel. Um, you're also part of the creation. Mm. And it was a really, really great experience. Next week I get to go and sit with the edit and um nice. turn in my director's cut by the end of next week yep nice nice that's so dope um so i mean can we expect you to do more directing like do, did you enjoy it enough that you'd like to do more of it like what's next for you yeah i mean i'm directing acting writing producing my visual art all of those things will continue and i'm just going to continue working on projects that excite me. I'm writing my next feature right now. I'm taking meetings about possibly directing other projects. Uh, A script came my way that I'm really in love with uh, to play the lead in, and I'm really excited about that. So yeah, I've I've always really been multidisciplinary, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that will always continue. And uh, yeah, so I'm just have my hands on all of those things right now okay cool where where can uh where can people find you on the internet and social media miss numa is my instagram and my twitter as well i'm pretty responsive 
to everybody. <laughs> so, okay. um, so yeah, you can follow me there. And yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm also on Facebook. I'm not as responsive on Facebook, but mm. um, you can definitely uh, connect with me on Instagram and Twitter. Okay. And what about, um, oh, what about Jezebel? Are we, are we going to be, are we going to be able to see that this year? I believe so. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> we will. We will. All right. Thank you, Numa. Appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Black Film Space podcast. If you're interested in being part of our community and attending events, please visit us at blackfilmspace.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Black Film Space. Subscribe to our email list and podcast. Thank you. See you soon.